Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another artist chat on the JoyStream platform. We are joined today by Elizabeth Streb. Um, I am a huge fan, so this is quite an honor to get to spend an afternoon chatting with Elizabeth. Hi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How <laughs> how exciting this has been. It's been on my um, calendar for a while and I've been thinking about all of the ways that my life has intersected with you over the many years. So I wanted to just um, take a moment to talk about the first time I saw your company perform, I think. Um, and you performed in the piece and it was at the Joyce. Uh, I was it was many, many years before I started working there. So I believe that it was a work or an evening that was inspired by um, superheroes and like evil Knievel. But the thing that I remember beyond anything else, it's just like an image or a moment that is seared in my brain, is you standing sort of like as far down stage towards the lip of the theater as possible and there was this very high very scary piece of wood i think with just like a tiny cutout at the top like <laughs> square and you were just standing there and i feel like i probably had a very close ticket to the stage and i feel like i could see you like visibly I don't know, shaking is not the right word, but just like the the adrenaline. And I want to say it, it, was, it was fear to me, but I don't know what your experience was. But this kind of like, now I understand quite classic. Is it Chaplin? Yes. Yes, it is. The, yeah. the, I stole the move. I stole the move. Well, I don't know. <laughs> he probably stole it too. Like we're all... I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't know. This, Maybe. this this moment of like human being object with this tiny cutout and it just falls incredibly perfectly around you. And um I have never forgotten that wow. okay. image and that moment and your company. It was such a um I was a young probably either in college or post college and it just kind of shattered my understanding <laughs> of Interesting. Dance of of physical of the physical realm of like how the breadth of what was possible. And um that was a long time ago. Or maybe two decades, I don't know, something yeah, like. it could have easily been two <laughs> yeah. decades. But Aaron, don't you think it's interesting? Like all I kept asking my technicians to do was to make the aperture smaller and smaller <laughs> and they argued at first but when you think let's say this is a sideways board like this and the little holes here and the whole issue of that curve and when the bottom was going to the incidence of it getting to the absolute top of my head but behind it a little mm -hmm. and and how close can you get to have that moment that I'm so um, honored that you remember it so vividly, have an effect, hold content. And I think my whole examination of everything I've done was to ask that question, you know, how can action without the reference system we have been so happy with utilizing in the dance world, this refers to mm -hmm. Sleeping Beauty, or this refers to, or this is about the music or all of the different tributaries we've taken to save ourselves from what the heck action is you know so that's a perfect start because i think and i think how long things should be mm -hmm. for me everything should be extremely short because you re because i think that that whole analysis of what's not what what to leave in what to leave out mm -hmm. And it also just, you know, as I was watching the works that you're sharing with our audience, um, a, a list of words, I'm just going to read them to you because it's fun, but I think it, it, it 
it kind of that moment in my memory of your body and uh, the the weight of the moment that was about to happen has all of this. It's like your work. It's kind of like a thesis or like a, a shot of espresso of your work or something. But it, I, I wrote down disorientation, precarity, fear, limitation, communication, balance, momentum, control, time, and continuum, uh, which- Can you send them to me? <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. But, you know, I, I think as, as a starting point, um, just what, like it's like you're a scientist or an engineer and i think uh the the theme of these works is massive rotations these these machinery that you've developed in tandem with the work that you're making and it's i don't even know if it's in tandem it's like the work it, it's impossible to separate like that is, so i think just from a very fundamental point how do you start like what what gets you started on a particular idea is it physics is it engineering first is it like i i know all of these things are kind of of interest but like action machine like what what's the like how does it start yeah, I think that that's, I mean, that's where I think if, you know, and I think I, I've always attempted to be rigorous about my inquiry, you know, to get to the simple question and not the tandem parts that are associated with a question, to really <laughs> try and understand one, what hasn't been um, occurring in the action art idea. You know, I, I tend not to use dance because the concerns of dance are not mine. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is to ask a question, and this is a, a phrase I've tabulated over the years, but to ask a question first, to ask a question that seems so unquestionably true, it doesn't occur to you to ask it. And so it's always back here at the left-hand corner of your brain. You can't even think it or see it. And so it isn't something you can force. I think I'll make a dance about, like right. that had to be stripped out of my, my psyche and my biology and to really get down to, and I think every artist does this, what am I curious about? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with the rotation, I realized it was the lack of any kind of speed demonstration on a stage. And how do you manifest acceleration at all? And to start to not say, oh, you can't do that on the stage because you'd be gone, right? Yeah, if you're going laterally, and it wouldn't even look fast because you'd be worried about, <laughs> I'm going to crash into something in the wings. And so I thought turning is the only kind of manifest destiny in my own like, description of what that might mean that I can utilize um, to start to use that, that little corner of what action really is, speed, acceleration, momentum. And what's the difference between speed, acceleration, and momentum? Mm -hmm. And that's why I came to each one of these pieces is about turning. Yeah. And do you, do you work with um, the ideas of these machines along with the performers? Like, are you kind of trying to build a machine that will, or an apparatus that will allow you to continue to ask these questions, like I guess I'm uh, maybe this is about research, um, right. like how your physical research with the performers, because everything that we're seeing is so. I mean, that's what I love about watching is just the elements of control, of awareness, like how all of these performers are so perfectly. Um, in control and understand the apparatus and their relationship to it. And also um, the, the joy of what they're doing, that there, there is um, a kind of 
pleasure to me in it as well. And so I guess I'm just um, how that research comes to be, like when safety and questions of speed and limitation are so fundamental to the performance and how safety, I mean, you're really like against like how, how much can we do? How much can we get away with? Yes, yes. And safety is critical, but in a way, if you think about danger and we have to invite danger into the room, first mm -hmm. we have to unstrip ourselves of all the cautionary um, behavior we've absorbed growing up, especially as a girl being told, yeah. you know, let me carry that for you and get away. I carry it myself. Let me open the door for you. Thank you, but no, I'll yeah. open it myself. Oh, that looks too heavy, that piece of plywood. Let me carry it. Mm -mm, I'm fine. It looks like I'm struggling because I am, but leave me alone. You know, and so danger, I think you're, the, the, the cusp of your question has to do with how, and I think that the, the, the actual knee-jerk reaction of movement practitioners um, is if they really analyze it, to stay way back from the edge of danger. I mean, way back from the edge of the cliff. Mm -hmm. and not realizing, um, and the world can argue with me if they want, but I've made this up in my own brain, in sure. my own heart. <laughs> and so my thought is how close can I get to the incidence of injury, danger? And mm -hmm. then can I get a little closer? And it's alarming how close you can get if you know that if a calamity occurs, you can solve the problem in the midst of the calamity. Not always injuries have happened as sure you know <clears throat> as, as everyone has if they know Streb they know that it's happened, um, but I try to figure out and I've decided it has to be fast twitch bodies and real brainiacs that come into the room. They are my dancers. Yes, we get the machine in there, and it's never what I expected. Yeah. <laughs> has too many spokes. Uh -huh. um, they can't get in and out. The act, if you're looking sideways at the wheel and it's turning this way, the uh, axle is this close to the edge of the wheel. So mm -hmm. it's a decapitating device, you yeah. know? Yeah. Don't, don't come outside. And if you do, do it fast and do it at the Northern hemisphere, you mm -hmm. know? And um, so none of the, the machines have prototypes and yeah. they break, you know? So let's say separate from all of that, the dancers have a critical part like I'd make drawings, like for instance, I'll have drawings of, I mean, you don't need to see all these. I'm, I, I'll go, I'll get in the weeds if I start showing you this. But when I'm alone, when yeah. I'm alone, I- Oh yeah. I start to ask my own questions with no knowledge of what's possible with the dancers. Mm -hmm. And so it's um, try this, mm, that didn't work. Try that, mm, no, don't do that. And I also can notice if a dancer and this is going back a long ways before I understood that you have to be a fast twitch person to do this. You've got a marathon runner and you've got a sprinter and they don't, you know, they don't very seldom trade roles. Mm -hmm. um, so it's my job to keep people safe, but it's also my job to alarm the audience, not just for, oh, it's a trick, but to have the content kind of expand away from what recognize one recognizes as a trick and go into a zone that um, you know maybe no one's ever seen before, including myself. And so the process of discovery has the dancers on that machine at first terrified and then getting comfortable like that ground that's never under them for very long because it's turning mm -hmm. yeah. um, is their home. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I... Um... Yeah, and I, I think that that um, it brings the audience in so much because I don't know, I just feel like we're we're hanging on the imagination and the possibility of ourselves in the work because you're actually like, I don't know, I, I don't I, I don't want to be too like, nerdy about my response to your work but like it it really is just it's science yeah. in a way um that's manifest poetically 
and beautifully with bodies, but we're just seeing motion. We're seeing like very elemental action, writ large and beautiful and kind of stretched. Like you're, you're expanding and um, contracting time in a way, or, you know, the, the power of the body to resist and, um, and to fold into momentum, you know, it's, it's just, I, I feel like it's, it's quite profound, the experience of that audience to performance alchemy that you build with the work yeah. because it feels human yeah and it's it, even though nobody's going to want to jump on the wheel or on the molinet machine you know necessarily around the fast turning lateral machine <laughs> late plate shift they recognize something i mean my 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 job aaron is to figure out how to um create recognition moments where hey I felt like that happened to me once, you know, I, you know, the classic thing is I slipped on a banana peel or I fell down the stairs or why are the most beautiful moments able to interrupt that are mostly considered accidents right. are able to interrupt passersby, you know, it's, it's like you could be talking about to your friend about finding the, you know, the, um, I don't know, you know, super force or the when the proton collider, you know, smash protons together. And how do they notice what has salience with the crash? And so much of it is garbage. And how do you, how do these amazing physicists figure out? I mean, they, they, you know, they figure it out because they're thinking and noticing about what's, what's salient and what is not. And so I think that my, my, uh, you know, my, my behavior, my analysis, my decisions. Uh, I don't think choreography is a group think, you know, my, because, you know, I could say I built the machine, I did this, I did that, but without those dancers who are scientists, but in their bodies. Anyway, I think that the, the process of this is, is something that I feel would create a vocabulary of specific events of action if we had a naming vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And that I've been searching for the iambic pentameter of action for ages. And why is that Shakespearean rhythm so pervasive in poetry and every other? And um, the, the, the poet Mary Oliver wrote a book poet's notebook, something like that. And she described, you know, what iambic pentameter is, of course, how much a human lung, how much air can a human lung breathe in? And that as it expels it, how many words can they get out? And I went, but of course, <laughs> from a physical place. Yeah. And it's language. I feel, and, and, and how we occupy space, you know, and then I think of the music and I've complained about this for so long. So let me just give me the honor of complaining to you about it. Yeah, please. <laughs> if it were language, if it were music, if it were philosophy, like, uh, you know, argument, fact, counter argument, bump the fact out of the way, go on. Yeah. If it were, we would have to name every place in space and we would have to name rhythms that only action can provoke. And I, I think that that's why people have decided, which I disagree with, mm -hmm. that the subject of dance is a body. And of course, I've said this a thousand times because what does Noam Chomsky say? You have to say things 27 times before anybody <laughs> hears what you're saying. Of course, this is like 27,000 times I've yeah. said. <laughs> but the body is just, the body, Aaron, is just not that interesting. I, I mean, you, are a gorgeous dancer, you no. know, you, you know, blow the socks off people next to you. I mean, that's why I would say, would you let him do a solo and I'll get out of the way. <laughs> but, but um, I, you have two legs, you have two arms, you have a hunk in the middle. I know what you can do. It's impossible to surprise me. Mm -hmm. And if people think it's beautiful, that's fine. But I think beauty is overrated. And I think we have to get down to cracking the membrane 
of possibility in our field. I, I'm trying to find just like a mic to drop. <laughs> I feel like that's <laughs> a drop. Yeah, for you. That's. I mean, I. Yeah, I I love that. I mean, it's it's certainly. I don't know. It, it's it's like one of those things where um, when I learned the this is the stupidest uh, example, but when I learned that the effect of eating asparagus on one's urine is <laughs> is is everyone has the same the the effect is universal it's the um the nose of certain people that experience the effect differently and that 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 science like who figured out it like why do you not but i do and who figured out that that was here and yeah. but that everybody was still like everybody's affected the same way and it's that shift that I feel like is is part of my um inability to <laughs> respond to you right now which is just that like you're talking about um <laughs> something perspective wise that I'm thrilled by um in terms of like move a outside of the body and it and look at action because yeah. that's I mean I'm just echoing what you're saying but um that's I'm sure you said it a million times so I'm sorry that it's gobsmacked me in this particular moment but but Aaron do you think it's true that I mean, I still am not positive. I'm just barking out my sure. yeah. thoughts and they're not, nobody can tell me I'm right or wrong because um, I don't think it's been proven right or wrong yet, but, but, and there is no wrong. But if you action, the specificity of action is invisible. You know, that's the crazy thing about the difficulty in our field, I think. Mm -hmm. um, how do you locate the subject? It's so swirly and, and the, <clears throat> I don't know, I'm not the one, I'm not an academic. So who would ever have a lab notation esque naming rigor, rigor um, to places in space? You know, like in a way, every little spot should have a name because it's just not the same falling from 10 feet or falling from 30 feet. Mm -hmm. it's subtle differences. And it causes a different effect, you know, a different reaction to, from 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 the audience and also from the dancers doing it. I just think action is. I'm so in love with it. I've always been so in love with it. I was not even a dancer when I signed up to major in dance at SUNY Brockport. Mm -hmm. and it was a brand new program in 19. What was it? 68. And so they let me in because I told them oh, I could pick up all the disco dances and teach them to my, I went to Our Lady of Mercy High School, old girls. So I teach them the rhythm to the newest dance. We'd go do it. And I was arguing with a woman named Rose Strasser, then the chair of the dance program. Uh -huh. She was probably my age then. Like I thought she was really old. Anyway, she said that has absolutely nothing to do with modern dance. And I go, well, I can snow ski and go really fast down the hills. And I choreograph my pathway and nothing to do with my, you know, over and over and over. And the beauty is, I, I, I insisted I train as a dancer because there wasn't any, any other field I could put myself into. Mm -hmm. And I thought I loved hardware, I had motorcycles, I love action, but I wanted fast and hard. Mm -hmm. And one of our battle cries is higher, faster, sooner, harder. And that's why every one of our pieces gets shorter and shorter, separate from throwing out the things that start to bore me. Yeah. Because I assume they'll bore someone else then. Anyway, it's just an experiment, you know, yep. I'm not, a, there's no period at the end of this sentence, but it's right. so great to talk to, you know, you have been, you know, the uh, inside out practitioner, you, you gorgeous dancer, you trained, you were that entity, and you are the eagle's eye view down on the field, you know, and even the worm's eye view up at the field. And so... Mm -hmm. That is enormous expertise, the breadth of it and what you're able to do and notice because you're noticing something like what Isaac Asimov said. Yeah. That, um, you know, when we 
he said the most exciting phrase to hear in science is not eureka but hmm that's <laughs> funny that's funny you know because you just think it's not what you expected but of course to find that not expected event or moment you have to be staring at something very boring and garbagey for a long time yeah and so i think that that's what you do you know when you decide to put someone on your stage you know i think that that's what you do and i love it's very exhilarating to speak to you and we're from you know a little bit opposite ends of the the spectrum of mm -hmm. our domain in the dance world yeah it's yeah i mean i think just what you said about um it's maybe i, I don't maybe you didn't say impossible, but just it's very rare, or maybe you did say impossible to be surprised by the body. And that is something I, I talk about surprise a lot when, you know, I'm in a room, especially with younger people being asked, like, what, what is it you look for as a programmer or a curator? Like, what do you, what are you seeking or you know, and it's always to me that very thing. I, I look for things that are unexpected, that surprise me, or that make me realize what I don't know. That's what I fall in love with in performance is being shown a part of the world or the universe or an idea or a person that makes me realize my own naivety you know, and that that is an experience that I want other people to share. So I bring, I want to bring that kind of artistry to audiences, but it's, it's something, you know, it is, it's very hard to be surprised. The body can do what it, what it can do. And I, I really appreciate what you're saying as, um, it just, it's really, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it, it's articulating something that I think I have felt for a long time. Um, the body is, it's hard to be surprised, but that's what I'm looking for is that, huh? Not the like Eureka, it's not like a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something more complex than Eureka, you know? Mm -hmm. And Eureka is sort of the period at the end of the sentence. By the time you get to Eureka, thousands of people have probably been involved in discovery of that particular whatever, medicine, science. And it's so, and everybody's always wrong. That's what I love about science. And yeah. it's always wrong. Yeah. Like, when, uh, what was his name? Ah, Wiles, or, or Wiles, the guy who solved Fermi's last theorem. It was, you know, there are those types of things. I mean, after yeah. hundreds of years, right? Yeah. Many, people just focusing on that. Andrew Wiles, I think his name was, and his, his 400 page paper and someone found a mistake in his paper, which <laughs> put him at, hey, game over. Uh -huh. He didn't solve it. He went back. Usually it takes other people to solve it because how could you, seven years of his whole life, right? Probably more than seven years working mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. But I was always impressed. This is years ago. I was always impressed I don't even know what the theorem refers to, to tell you the truth mm -hmm. or why it matters. But then he went back in there and found what was wrong. And I just thought, one, well, what humility. And we all have to remain so humble. You know, we're never gonna, we're never gonna put the period at the end of our sentences because unless you are disgruntled with your own process, you're not gonna be curious enough to rip it apart. And when you were talking about you know, talking to the kids, mm -hmm. younger people, or maybe even kids, um, they, you know, they, they embrace failure, you know, and failure to us, you know, people yeah. looking uh, out there and, you know, trying to see something they didn't see yesterday, you know, notice something, you realize, you know, failure is an ugly thing, you know, but to me, I, when I'm looking back, well, look, well now I have time to deal with archives a little bit, which has always been my most annoying response from funders. Well, what about your archives? I go, I'm only 70. Now, come on. <laughs> come on. But then I also think, you know, I also think um, that it's possible, that it's possible to 
and, and looking back at the earlier work, I don't know why the one of the first times we were at the Joyce, which Martin and Linda, they were so lovely. I, oh my God, what a mess. I still had huge things in there, you know, and they mm -hmm. let me, oh, yeah. in, you know, and, <clears throat> and then I was like, going, I was like thinking my set changes took longer than the pieces <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I didn't use music I just mic the sets and I'm sitting there and the jury's going oh my god I'm watching the video I can't believe they let me in that door most of my stuff has been not it has been a failure you know really as a piece mm -hmm. failure you know I mean I embrace failure because that's the only path to discovery but then sometimes you don't know how to leave the bad or the uh -huh unnecessary parts out because here's a great part here's a great part but i've got to do this to get to this <laughs> physically in the state yeah so it's constantly um, a process of attrition you know just get rid of it get rid of it get rid of it and the, what you said i would like when i dove through glass at the joyce mm -hmm. they let me do that it was a gala for i think cindy garrig who at the time ran the jerome foundation and uh they were asking me well where where does the glass end i mean where does it I go it, right at the edge of the stage. It doesn't go any further. It stops mm -hmm. there. Of course, I was just like, well, I'm only doing this once. So, <laughs> yeah. and I remember squatting down on the stage and thinking, and I knew I was getting ready to go. And and you have to. It's a technique where you have to. Um, let, let me get the. You can see this. I don't know who. Some gorgeous person at the Joyce took this picture. That's me. Oh my God. You can see my feet are apart, those two yeah. people. And the thing is, it was hanging. Uh -huh. And so you couldn't push it. Right. Game over, right? And and, you, and we both know what it's like to have a, a room full of funders and producers. <laughs> and I was like going, oh my God, oh my God. So you had to like get your, do your heel drive. So you're horizontal and then punch on your way through. So you have a hole and kind of what you were saying about the falling wall. This was my absolute favorite experience because it only lasted two seconds. And it said more than many of my eight minute dances and da, 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 da. So an essentialist act is really, I think, what we're all searching for, because mm -hmm. that's the only thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about surprise, right? I mean, I think if people knew that hanging piece of glass was not, yeah. who knew, who knew? Right. Well, it, it also, so one of my prefabricated questions was <laughs> just like about shelf life, which we're naturally talking about, but, but like how long, you know, any particular idea retains its interest to you, which I think we're, you already answered that. Um, and it, it's also kind of reminding or making me think about my own career as a performer, that when I started out as a young person, all I wanted was to work. And I thought work was performing. And so my ideal job when I was a kid was to be on Broadway, like doing, oh, okay. you know, chorus for like Fosse or something just because I was like I want to dance the great like these great choreographies I was in love with Bob Fosse but also the idea of just like doing eight shows a week to me made made the most like that was the most work yeah that I could imagine and as I became more mature what I realized is that performing was to me the kind of the worst part <laughs> of the show because I loved being in the unknown of and and I recognize that many performers find the unknown in performance and that that's why they stick it out but what I realized about myself was that I cared more about being in the room with the questions the mm. questions matter to be much more than the result and that performing the result and having to replicate the result over and over became less and less satisfying. And all I wanted to do was be in the room, being asked the question, being given the task, being a solver. Yeah. And I realized that like, I wasn't able to surprise myself 
in performance, that I stopped having, the body was not surprising. I knew what I could do and I knew what my limitations were. And I think that's why this is all just like reinforcing, but like the shelf life to me was the performance. I didn't, it, it like actually started to make me anxious. And I, I just wanted to be back in the comfort of the unknown and the unsolvable because I feel like, like with you, I was working with Annie B. Parson and I felt like every piece was just, it wasn't the start of something new. It stopped being like a first day of school. It just was a continuation of the questions that remained after the last time we had to stop and put lights on it and show it at BAM. But it was like, okay, we're still just asking the questions and all I wanted was to get back into the questions. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And so I that that I guess the shelf life for you, I'm thinking about these objects and the research, and it's like in in a way you're, as I see it, you're building these impossible challenges, and then through research with these dance scientists, these incredible action heroes, you're solving some of the questions of the object, and so you have to inevitably move on to other questions or other objects that pose new challenges. Uh, and I guess that's a question mark, not a statement, but what, like, what is that experience for you? Do you get to a point where you're like, yep, I, I, I explored all of the possibilities of this particular machine let's build a new one. By the way, which has put me into debt so many times. Yeah. <laughs> I am the best debt bundler of any choreographer, I, I think. Uh -huh. Everything is so expensive. And, yeah. and what I was going to ask, and in the prototypes, so they break. Yeah. They break all the time. Yeah. So um, I wanted to ask you, though, before I answer fully that question, that beautiful question you asked, what is your thought? What happens with action? Because you were talking about, you know, the dream of performing every night on Broadway eight times. What happens with the notion of repetition in action? Like, is it possible to have something be surprising? I know it can be accurate and it can be what the choreographer wanted to go with the music. But in your mind, Aaron, what happens maybe just with the singular body, with the repetition and the repetition? Can it can action allow the window for things to be new every single time when it's not different? I yeah, absolutely. I think I yes. Um yeah. Can be different. Well, because yes, because every like all of those everything is brand new every time. So you're you're kind of uh, even with repetition, your brain is different, your body is different, the air is different. The I mean, just the way that music uh, or energy from the audience can make can feel so heavy. Like the the times when you were performing for an audience that was like the second show night or the Friday night or the, you know, like we have as performers and stage people, showbiz folks, like all of these, like, oh, it's a Friday night audience. They had a long work week and they're, they had a cocktail and they're sitting back in their chairs. They're not leaning forward, you know, whereas a Saturday night people are like, you know, we have all of these like theories, but the thing is like, it can feel incredibly different every moment because it's like the audience like you're calling them with you sometimes and other times it's like you can barely you feel like you're racing with them like you can barely keep up with their appetite and the energy feed and that to me was like that's where the repetition is like you're doing the same set of actions again choreography but everything around you is completely different than any other time you've ever performed that set of actions 
because of the audience and the feeling in the room and your feeling as a human being, you know, 24 hours later, of course, it's not going to be the same. And you drill and down. And also science, the atmosphere, the world, like all of the molecules of the earth are ordered in whatever way they are today. Yeah. And I yeah. think that actually led me to a kind of, sorry, this is turning into like our therapy session, but like oh. it kind of led me to a, a, an anxiety about performing mm -hmm. because I, I began to resent the changes in the environment around or in which I needed to perform my repetitions. <laughs> like it started being, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's well, you're an artist, you know, yeah. artists, artists, you, you depend on the monikers in the space to know where you are to, you know, which is another, you know, not you specifically, Aaron, but another problem, like when I was studying ballet for all those years, um, not as a ballet dancer, but as a modern dancer, I thought, oh, the eight positions of the body, you know, you're referencing the room. Yeah. Where that's nothing to do with action, you know? So you're just, that's your comprehension. That's your structure for somehow knowing where you are mm -hmm. rather than referencing your body, which is never in the same space. And it's yeah. a much more complex activity and requires different sort of nomenclatures, not just to understand in words, but um, if there is such a thing as an action conceit or an action structure, which of course it's invisible and there's no there there, and it, but it is someplace, but it's only there for half a second. I think that the, the notion of how we, like the idea of repetition, as you mentioned so beautifully, it's never the same. You know, we might get lazy and think it's the same, mm -hmm. but then we're not present, you know? And, and I was thinking like, could I, could I circle back to the machines? Yeah. For a second? Yeah, please. <laughs> um, because when you bring in like a, a, the wheel, the revolution wheel or, you know, Noe Espon, I mean, again, I work with technical people like Michael Caselli first, who was this, amazing guy who I dragged out of the kitchen who we, mm -hmm. and Heather Carson, my original lighting designer who used um, strip lights vert yeah. vertically, no vertically. Yeah. And also, um, you know, industrial lights, you know, to, aimed at the audience, like every <laughs> annoying thing. <laughs> and we, the three of us on tour, oh my God, we would go to uh, an airport and look for the red cat, red cap guys. And I'd have a wad of, hundreds of dollars in my pocket get these on the plane I mean it was just like please god kill me now you know yeah. this is so hard and we would yell at each other and anyway the notion the notion of the machine and the fact that you know in those days it was just wood and rope and stuff but the machine breaks and and there's this um I have dreams of you know ascending to I'm waiting for my Barry Gordy or my Colonel Parker to notice that this is this phenomenon of action that Streb does is not for the, do you say cog cognoscenti? How do you say that word? Oh, I don't, I won't even pretend to try. <laughs> you know what I mean though. Yeah. The higher ups. Yeah. I, I, I got the sadness that I'm gonna be performing for the elite for the rest of my live long days, except for when we're at the Olympics or we're outside down at Brookfields or something. Yeah. And in this time period, I, I've been very, very aware. I just am not going to spend my dying day when my head hits the pillow or hopefully explodes for the <laughs> last time. Um, yeah, that's not what I want my reality to be. You know, um, if anything, the circus, I mean, it's the only structure that would encompass Streb and have nobody notice. But let me not wander. Let me say that there's this um, guy, I think his name is Astro Teller. And I heard him at the TED Talks okay. and uh, he runs the Moonshot Factory. And most people inventing, like he worked with windmills, he wanted them to float up off the ground so they could find the wind rather uh. than, oh gee, we put this <clears throat> trillion dollar, you know, fan, uh, what do you call them? Uh, beautiful uh, fans? No, they're not that, but- Turbines? No. <laughs> they're fans, but they're huge. Windmills. Yeah. In a field, right? Oh. There's no wind there. Anyway, they were going to go up and he'd conceive of the things that were necessary in his mind or someone brought the idea to him. 
And they'd go through this whole massive um, trial and error moment. And then let's say they find out that the first prototype would cost $200 million. And, and they had this, this, this sort of battle cry, fail fast. You know, mm -hmm. Do not build a $200 million prototype, bad idea. Um, you know, and just in comparison, and I'm, he was, besides Renzo Piano, he was my favorite, favorite speaker of all, <clears> because <throat> I wrote, this is a prototype, and it keeps breaking, 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 because of the forces that we impose on this machine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's expensive enough to have all my dancers get on the spokes of the London Eye in yeah. the, for the Olympics in 2012, but I don't know how much it's going to cost. Anyway, I think that how, one, the category we enter into, like you were saying about Broadway or the modern dance world, what, I mean, I think I was gonna be a PE teacher until I walked into the gym and thought they were, I was very homophobic. I've always been gay, but I'm like, oh, I'm not doing that. So mm -hmm. I went over to the dance department. <clears throat> um, but, but I think that what we, where I think the where of where we can go, we don't have time to investigate who's our audience, you know, and we don't even know what we're doing at the beginning. But I think my, my point is when you were asking, you know, how many, I think of those instruments as like musical instruments, hmm. right? You don't roll a piano out on the stage and the whole audience goes, I've heard that. You know, they don't do that to that. And it's an endless amount, but if I could get people to look at the forces and the action and the, the ideas of acceleration and the ideas of being ejected and not, what does it mean? Then they would notice when I bring the revolution wheel back and it's not the same dance, it does turn. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and yes, there's vocabulary as there is in every field. Yeah. But um, I guess the other, the other thing about these, these, these contraptions is, uh, well, it's a constant uh, fiscal problem and it's a constant mechanical problem. And uh, yet it's the heart and soul of everything I've ever been interested in. So I just count myself lucky as a doc. And I, I love your story about, you know, as a young dancer, having a dream for this and then realizing it's good, bad and ugly. Mm -hmm. And the way you drifted around, not drifted, but chosen to move to yeah. do so much. You have so much experience, Aaron, on all different aspects of the dance world. And um, I think I've just been, I, I feel like I've kind of my head, I just stuck my head into this wall and my feet are still dangling. And I've never mm -hmm. stopped being interested in that idea of force, velocity, momentum, machinery. Yeah. It's really, um... Yeah, I I recognize all of that and the the ways that you continue to evolve your interests though, like thinking about ascension with um, the addition of video design and kind of bringing the perspective of the performer, just kind of enhancing enhancing maybe is the wrong word, but. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's adding a different layer of experience, but just, yeah, curious, I mean, as like looking at Rocket Gizmo and Revolution and um, just like where you think the, like what, what your questions are right now, what you're curious about. And I, I love what you said at the beginning, and maybe it was pre-recording, but um, that you're a person who's a present tense person. So I I don't uh, I don't pretend to know <laughs> how you're supposed to answer anything about the future, but like I, I guess I'm just wondering how it continues to evolve for you, like what that might look like, or what that looks like today. Yeah, the future, the uh, you know, I have Christine Chen as my executive director, who is spectacular. You know, she was a dancer years ago with us. Then even when she went to get her MBA, then came back and, uh, you know, we dragged her out of the 92nd Street Y, but two years before that, she was on our board for two years. So she's uh -huh. 
she knows <laughs> all the nooks and crannies yeah. of it. And uh, she leads, you know, she, I totally trust her. I don't second guess her. Um, but at this point, <coughs> excuse me, at this point, um, I'm able to see what the problems with Streb touring, let's just say, because what we've done is we've just cut a million dollars out of our budget. And, uh, and that is touring and slam. Like we have slam, you know, and we're, but we are not, you know, doing the flying trapeze. We don't have our kids program. We don't have birthday parties for obvious reasons. Yeah. And so, you know, she beautifully did that. We all took a pay cut um, as it should be. Um, but <clears throat> cause I don't really know the time frame on this. And then it's allowed me to think about dragging all of my stuff in a 53 foot lorry <laughs> and then loading it into the theaters and it took 25 hours and I made holes. I ruined their stage. I don't think they should have fancy floors in the theater or nice, get over it. I mean, I remember yelling at Liz Diller when we did the ICA a couple of times. Uh -huh. Like I couldn't even like drill into your floors, Liz. What do you yeah. think? <laughs> and then I always would say, gee, other choreographers get asked back to different yes. shows. <laughs> no, once is enough. I mean, a few did, a few did. Yeah. But, you know, no. So the future, you know, I'd like a hostile takeover. I mean, if I had my way, you know, I'd love someone who saw the unreasonable part of Streb and realized, oh, I have an audience for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, we have an audience, you know, yeah. but really my favorite place to perform is Slam. Mm -hmm. and, and Martin and I, just before you did the, the switch, were talking about me coming back into the Joyce, but it was just, um, well, the numbers didn't work and I just wasn't sure, you know, um, I mean, that was my home. I mean, I think the Joyce has been, was my home in my early years. And before that, it was the kitchen. <laughs> and yep. then David White at DTW did our first show in 1981. And it was, um, I brought a hill up the stairs, you know, <laughs> big hill. And he was like, what's that? I go, it's a hill. You know? <laughs> and it's, uh, so, so I guess my, I have had time, obviously, given this exp explanation to your beautiful question about the future. I'm like, what, what is unreasonable? Mm -hmm. you know, fiscally and what constantly leaves me in a deficit situation. Um, and so I'm thinking out, outdoor stuff, you know, I'm thinking, you know, we're talking to Brookfield properties. We were talking to the Kennedy Center to try and open a part of their, they were going to call it uh, River Run Festival, Alicia mm -hmm. Adams. And I wanted to walk on water. That's been one of my obsessions for a while with a zip line over us across the Potomac. And one of my unbelievable collaborators is Robin Elias with Unusual Rigging in London. He's the one that made, made the Olympics for Streb anyway possible. Yeah. He's, he's, okay. he's a errant outlaw of don't even try. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm thinking that that's more practical. There's not a huge market for it. But I think, I, I, I really, I don't know. I just don't think I'll be dragging that 53 foot truck, you know, all around America, mostly, or even Europe, you know? So I'm, um, I'm not a practical person though. I'm not, Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not gonna become a practical person clearly. Yeah. So. I know that doesn't to totally answer your answer. No, no, it, I, I mean, the, the, the question is always a pretend one, you know, it's really just like, what's, what's on your mind right now, you know? And that also like repetition will be different in an hour, you know? <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Tomorrow. So yeah. I, I think it's just, uh, yeah, I, I, I took a flying trapeze class at your studio. Oh, you. <laughs> it was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's close to the ground, which is more dangerous probably, right? Yeah, um, but it, it, it it's a it's a wonderful space um and it's just such a i think it's such a gift to new york to have those classes and to have young people experiencing curiosity and all of the things that you're interested in that you know 
velocity, force, gravity, momentum, action. It's really, um, it feels like a special place. And I guess in terms of evolution, maybe, well, I, I think I, I'm about to ask you about collaboration because of the recent work with City Company, but I'm also like, one of the things I had down on my um, list of thoughts was just vocalization and the ways that the performers are constantly communicating with each other, which is both a necessity and I appreciate it as an aesthetic. And you talking about just miking the stage in the early works and not having any music, um, it, it's, it resonates with me because when I see your work, I think a lot about the Worcester group. Yeah. And Liz. Yeah. And, I don't think what you both are doing is separate. Um, and, and so I guess I, I, you know, in collaborating with Anne and City Company, I wonder if that experience is part of your future curiosity. Mm -hmm. other people's brains <laughs> other what other what? other people's brains you know oh my god <clears throat> i'm obsessed with other people's brains yeah. you know, <laughs> free me from myself i often say <laughs> yeah <laughs> um <clears throat> ann bogart and i had i mean i love liz Lecombe. i i think she's at least as impractical as i am yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i uh, and actually, uh, before Slam, I mean, when I wasn't able to perform at my Canal Street studio, which I had from 77 to 95, uh -huh. so we were on the third floor and I was oh. very happy and proud of destroying their, their people's tire frames were f falling yeah. off the fifth floor. Yeah. And, and I'm like, yes, what dance company can do that? So I went into different garages and ended up at St. Anne's Warehouse when Susan Feldman was just moving into this mm -hmm. massive no heat space yeah. and anyway it was a year and then i got i got slam um, you know thanks to the um commissioner kate levin and uh, tracy knuckles and uh i think margaret morton and they figured out how to to allow us to buy it and getting doug steiner to sell it to me and you know it was a great venture i just love that yeah i love real estate um <clears throat> but susan feldman <laughs> Uh, uh, towards the end of my tenure there, rented to the Worcester Group. Mm -hmm. And they were, <laughs> um, you know, trying to get, you know, incur in my time, you know, that I had there. And uh, and I said, why can't, look, it's huge. Why can't we do this together? We'll rehearse at the same time. How cool. Because you make too much noise, <laughs> she said. And I go, too much noise? I mean, if Liz Comp, you know, was rehearsing and, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. And a jackhammer was outside, you know, digging up the street. Would she go up to the jackhammer guy and say, "Could you just not do this till my rehearsal's over?" No, <laughs> you know. So I was just thinking, we are so privatized, Aaron. You know, we want a quiet space that nobody can enter. And as I started going to the garages, you know, from '95, '96, '97, all the way to 2003 when I moved into Slam. I wanted to work in a public space, you mm -hmm. know, and I think that um, I think I was completely charmed and terrified of Liz LeCompte, you know, and and really appreciated the theater she was doing and the questions she was asking, not that I understood all of them. Mm -hmm. Ian Bogart and I crossed paths hundreds of times, I think, you know, we had the same agent, Rena Shagan. I'm probably a person that switched agents more often than any other choreographer. <laughs> I, know. I kept Anyway, we were at Rena Shagan's <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we would run into each other in different cities. We were, I, I deeply respected the kind of um, viewpoints and Suzuki technique. Her, her, her words came out of or from a physical place. Mm -hmm. And Chuck Me, who she often worked with, was the one that encountered me and wanted to work together. Um, and I, I was like, I don't do words, you know, I'm sorry. I'm just not gonna do words. I don't care about them. Mm -hmm. And then I said, uh, <clears throat> Anne Bogart, you know, I'll, I'll work, I'd love to work with Anne Bogart. And it was a glorious, you know, we never fought, mm -hmm. but we, I just, you know, for instance, I didn't want my dancers to speak because every time I've seen that, it's like, oh no, they're not trained to speak on stage. Yeah. Some of them now are, you know. Yeah. 
Um, and I, I made my guck machine. I got to do my big dream of making a massive mass. And only, only Jed Wheeler <laughs> let me in there, like, cause he is, he was my agent way back. You know, that's how I met Linda Greenberg or mm -hmm. Bach now. Anyway, um, it's, it's been, a, a, and Anne, I, I think she's the smartest woman on earth and I learned from her. And we spent three weeks at Skidmore, the June before uh -huh. yep. we did the September thing at, at Mont Montclair. Um, as far as doing it again, I'm too selfish, I think. You know, I, 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 I haven't finished my set of questions. I haven't solved any problems. I've just been experimenting, you know, and that's, and that's, and I have a lot of collaborators. It's just, I guess, I mean, I loved the time with Anne and I loved what we came up with and I thought her direction, I had no idea how the manifestation of the mixture mm -hmm. would come out. But she, all I did the whole rehearsal period, both at Skidmore and at Montclair was pull the cords, pull the cords, pull the cords. <laughs> no, no, she was saying, we can do that later. I go, no, you can't. Cause no one's gonna wanna get guck on their heads <laughs> and the bodies and on the floor and the buildup on the floor. And what we were talking about earlier is it's, it's all a big accident, mm -hmm. you know because the dancers were avoiding these two bowling balls. So were the actors and they had to keep pulling them. It's so anti-intuitive. And even when I watch the footage, I'm like, why didn't they keep pulling it? You could have pulled it in the air right there. You know, I'm, I'm just. <laughs> um, but well, you I, said I, it sooner. What? You said it sooner, right? What are the four words? Sooner. Uh, well, they're higher, faster, sooner, harder. You yeah. can say them in any order. But yeah, sooner, always, always yeah. pull them, pull them, pull them. And of course, the thing you're pulling, you don't know what you're pulling. Mm -hmm. And I kept having Zaire mix it around because the, the actors and the dancers would know what was coming out of there and then they'd avoid certain ones. Yeah, They would probably argue with me on that point, but <laughs> I, I, all, I, all I wanted was what happens? What happens when you watch your choreography disintegrate before your very eyes? Because that's what happens in life. Mm -hmm. And this was only circumstance that skill could not override the fact that you are on an ice field once molasses and flour and water and um, uh, sprinkles and mylar strips and cereal and paint pods would fall and cascade down flour. You know, it was just a massive mess. And what happens to the human psyche when you're supposed to be running in a circle, avoiding the bowling balls, diving and pulling, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was glorious i was just but then we were going to tour a lot of presenters came in there and then you found out how much it was going to cost and yeah none <laughs> and i i didn't think we could tour it because it's two companies and too complex and anyway yeah <clears throat> well i'm sure that um we should probably end but i feel like i could spend a day I'm speaking of selfishness, just enjoying your time. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to see if there's one last question, but I, I don't think, I feel like leaving it on an ice, <laughs> on an ice field, you know, <clears throat> I just want to thank you for your connection to the Joyce, I, I, you know, name Martin as a huge towering figure that I have, it's, it's odd to think that there's only ever been two programming directors at the Joyce and that I'm one of them. I, yeah. I yeah. take that responsibility very, very seriously and recognize how much he did and how many careers how many people like yourself can say, I can't believe they let me in the building, you know? Yeah. And I, in, I aspire to connect with a whole new generation of artists who Linda may look at me and say, how are we, what are we, 
and it's just like I, I want to let these people in the building it's it's yeah, their building beautiful. it's your building it's our building um so thank you for sharing the work i'm um i really enjoyed getting to remember my experiences of seeing you at the Joyce, but also seeing the evolution of the work that out of necessity outgrew our beautiful special theater that was built for its own purposes, you know? Yes. Um, but I, I just, I cherish the place that you hold in the world. And I'm really honored to be able to spend an hour, you know, sharing thoughts. I, I feel like I, you asked me more questions than I asked you, which is one is a process of self-discovery. Um, and so I thank you for the opportunity to converse. It's really special. Um, um, Aaron, you're so welcome. And uh, thank you for letting us in the proverbial um, mm -hmm. door, even though you don't have to hear the drills going crazy. In the <laughs> but uh, I'm very honored when I heard about uh, us being part of your strep being part of your fall season, I was overjoyed. So um, however we get in that door, whatever yeah. that door is made out of, I'm very, very happy to be associated with you and the Joyce Theater and give Linda my love. Absolutely. Thank you again. And I suppose this is an anniversary. Is that true? An anniversary. Season for the company. Is this a part of a, uh, anniversary season? No. Uh, no, you know why? Because I don't count my, I don't even know how long. I know. I, <clears throat> we don't really, I know a lot of directors have wanted me to say it's our 40th anniversary, but I always find that quite depressing. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't want to do that, but it, perhaps it is, but I don't know which one it would be, Yeah. And which, which um, it would be. Uh, but I, uh, I, I mean, I, I will say that the next question is, you know, how, where does dance occur, you know? And is it, is it, have we built the perfect theater building space for that? And can we strip out the elitism and the idea that we are not noticing who we do not let in that door? Mm -hmm. You know, the smelly, loud, horrible, raucous people you know let's I, I think let's strip all that away and get uncomfortable again with who we're sitting next to or standing next to that's that's all i would say brilliant i i say the same cool cool i yes where can dance occur i love that um it's a great place to end okay it's a great question and i can't wait to see how both of us answer <laughs> and answer and answer and answer it's as as you say there's no period so there's no period so uh, have a um, wonderful day i will but promise that we will get together physically when all this passes i absolutely that. yes i would love that okay thank you my best to you and to the company okay thank you very much bye bye bye